Today on the Ask Brady Show, we talk about how to re-engage contacts on your email list that are not opening your emails anymore. Welcome to the Ask Brady Show, episode number 60. We've got four great questions from the people of Pro Church Nation, and I'm joined as always to my left, your right, it's Roxanne. It's true. True it is, behind the camera, the editing wizard himself, Jonex. And the man with the cam crouching in the corner like a weirdo, Alex Thrills. Thanks. It's not really as special as it sounds because I work here, but I'm here. Roxanne, take us away with the first question. All right. First question comes from Tony, and he sent in a video. Hi, Brady. Hi, Roxanne. And hello, team of Pro Church Tools. We appreciate all you do. Tony here from Thrive Church, California, again, with a question about purging your email list. I remember you talking about it, and uh, I think it's time that we do that. We've got a lot of emails that go out and I don't think there's anything that comes back. Um, But we know that we do have people who are absolutely engaged. So could you put uh, maybe in the comments or let everybody know how to download like a a template for the very best email to send out, uh, which is a, hey, if you don't do anything with this email, we're going to take you off our list email. Is there a specific Um, email that you've done in the past and sent out, which is really effective. I'd love to see a template for that. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for the question, Tony. This email purging practice is something that we do with our Pro Church Tools email list every once to twice a year. Every once to twice a year. And we do funnel people through a re-engagement campaign, which is what we call it when we do this. So normally we don't just go in and say, okay, if you haven't opened in the last three months, you're gone. Normally what we do is we take that group, segment them, and run them through a re-engagement campaign, basically a last chance campaign, hopefully to get them back into the fold. Mm -hmm. Basically, we leave the 30,000 to go for the 7,000. How biblical. Exactly. And so there is a series of emails that we send, and and I basically took screenshots from each, and so uh, Jonas can throw them up on the screen. If you're listening, I'm going to read them word for word, and you can begin implementing these templates in a similar way with yours. The way I do this first is I segment the list. If you have not opened or clicked an email in the last three, six, or 12 months, it depends on how I'm feeling. It tends to differ, but don't go any less than three months. Even three is a little bit not too much. And this is opened or clicked. You know, very few people are going to reply to an email. Mm -hmm. Few are going to click and, you know, some are going to open. But you don't want to, you know, you don't want to give someone, you know, a bad mark just because they don't click an email. Opening is still good, right? And so these are for the people that are not interacting with emails at all. Mm -hmm. Where basically every single time they see an email, they're like, delete. And basically, I just want to ask them in this re-engagement campaign, as you'll hear as I read through the templates, like, If you don't want to be on this list, cool. Let us know and we'll take you off. So I send a series of three emails. And the first email basically reads as follows. And the headline, the subject line for this is, is everything okay? Question mark. Okay. And it reads this. Hey, first name. I noticed it's been a while since you've opened or clicked one of my emails. So I just thought I'd check in on you and let you know what you've missed in the last 90 days. Check it out. And then I put in a link of three to five of like our best pieces of content that we've had recently. And there's also been quite a few new episodes of the Pro Church podcast, Pro Church Daily, which you can catch up on right here. I know with travel, family, and the daily grind of ministry, it can be hard to stay on top of things, but Pro Church Nation, it's a tight-knit family. So you'll have to forgive me if I give you the occasional poke just to make sure you haven't somehow slipped through the cracks. Hope all is well, Brady. So that's the first email. Second email I send reads like this, and I think this one, if the subject line for the other one is everything okay, this one is are you still there? Question mark. Hey, it's Brady. I've noticed you haven't opened any of my emails in a while. This makes me wonder, am I bothering you? Are you not getting the value you expected? Or do you think you received too few messages, maybe too many, whatever it is? I hope you still want to hear from me. If you do want to keep receiving these updates, you need to click the link below. And the link below just reads, link to mystery gift. 
It will lead you to a special mystery gift. No purchase, registration, or anything like that required. Note, normally this resource costs money, but I want you to have it for free. I hope you click it. Smiley face. Another link to the mystery gift. P.S. If your account does not register a click in the next couple of days, I'm going to go ahead and unsubscribe you from this list. It's not that I don't want you here, but it's been over three months since you've shown any interest in the emails I'm sending you, and the last thing I want to be is just another email cluttering your inbox. So you'll see the shift in this email. The first one is, hey, have you missed anything? And a lot of people are going to respond to that email just because of the headline. Is everything okay? Mm -hmm. If anyone opens or clicks any of these re-engagement emails, I add them back into the Pro Church Tools email list. Because I don't need you to click. As long as you open, that means you're engaged enough and you're going to be signaling to your inbox, this is an email I want to read, which is good for email deliverability. So that's how I'm segmenting that. In this second email, I kind of shift and I go, just so you know, we're going to remove you if you don't take action. And here's an extra special gift just to show you that you matter to us. And if you click on that, you'll be good. Final email I send. And this one says, I think I I titled this one just, I titled this one goodbye or last chance or final warning. It says, hey there. It's Brady. One thing I really hate is a cluttered email inbox. I I take extra care to only receive emails I want to receive. And so I don't want to be sending you emails if you don't want to hear from me. So if you want to continue to hear from you, your action is required. If they open, their action has already been taken. But I'll say that anyway. Just click this link, hyperlink there, which will apply a tag to your account telling me that you want to continue to hear from me. Yay. Otherwise, do nothing. And then I guess this will be goodbye and take care. You know what? Relationships don't always last forever. They require buy-in from both sides. So no hard feelings if you've fallen out of love. Trying to have some fun with it. But if you want to stay in touch, click here. That's all for now. P.S. If your account does not register, click in the next 48 hours. I'm going to go ahead and unsubscribe you from this list. Again, it's not that I don't want you here, but it's been more than three months since you've shown any interest in the emails I'm sending. And the last thing I want to be is just another email in your inbox. Just click the link below to stay in touch. If not, I hope you cross paths again down the road with a final call to action link. So those are the three emails that I sent in the re-engagement campaign. I looked at the stats. We had about 7,000 people go through our last re-engagement campaign, and we got about 4 to 7% open rate on each email with 1% click on each email. So that's like 15 to 30% of contacts that we saved through that engagement re-engagement campaign. So that's thousands of people that, you know, sometimes you just don't click to open stuff in a while. Nothing piques your interest or you're just so used to seeing the the email. A lot of these people that were on the list were just like, they listen to the podcast so they don't need to open the email because they're listening to every single piece of content. And so feel free to use these, rework them for your church. Hopefully you find them helpful. Perfect. All right. Question two comes from Seth and he says, Hey, a friend of mine and I are taking over my church's social media as a project as we are interns through our church. And I was wondering if you have any information that may help us amp up our church's social media. The biggest challenges we face is one where we live where people are slow on the whole social media aspect, both younger and older. And two is all the older generation don't like what we do. So is there any information or advice that you may have that would possibly help with those? Well, thanks for the question, Seth. This question was sent directly through the DMs on Instagram, and I followed up this question kind of pushing back on this idea that Seth was presenting, saying, look, my area is slow to get on social. And I asked him, I said, do you have any data on this? Is this just a hunch? And he did say, I forgot what the data is. I know one of my pastors sent us both a link to it, but I can't remember where they found it. I live in Kalispell, Montana, in the Rocky Mountain region. So what I did was because I'm a data nerd like I am, I went to the U.S. Census Data and Bureau, and I found a little bit of data on Kalispell, Montana, and that data is as follows. Most importantly, I just, to, to, I'll, I'll preface this, the reason I went to the data of the census was because I do not believe what Seth is saying. Right. If you live in America, and you're in a reasonably populated area, and Kalispell is one of the largest in that part of Montana, cities based on Wikipedia, You know, it's probably untrue, and it's probably just a hunch that you have. Mm -hmm. And if you do find the data, Seth, please do send it. I tried to search for it independently, but I could not find it. Uh, Here's what the data says about Kalispell. I did not save it. Great. Okay, so I remember it. Don't worry. I thought I put it in my Slack. I must have just started the message and not (laughs) enter. (laughs) My grocery list is here, but not the data on <laughs> That's Kalispell, That's going to be super helpful for Montana. us right now. 25% of the people in Montana, uh, in Kalispell, Montana, as of 2016, were 18 and under. So you've got a huge cohort that is young. Every single kid that is growing up wants to be a YouTuber nowadays. It's true. And 25% of Kalispell, Montana is watching YouTube because they're of that age. The median age 
in Kalispell is 35 and a half years old, two years younger than the national average. So this isn't like you're living in some retirement community, and even that, the average person 50 plus spends four, uh, four, more than four hours every single week on social media. I, the thing that stood out to me in Seth's message was, look, both young and old don't use social, and all the old people hate everything we do. A lot of what was coming through to me in Seth's messaging was kind of self-defeating me- like words, basically just saying, look, this is the problem, this is the problem, there's all these problems, what are we supposed to do? I just think that the best thing you can do, Seth, is shift your mindset a little bit, less to this is what's working against us, and more to this is what we have going for us. Mm -hmm. I was really interested just looking into the data on your specific region and city. Every single region has good things and bad things. So for instance, we live in Niagara, and in Niagara, it's this huge tourist place. So every single year, you have hundreds of thousands of people pouring into our area, the roads are clogged, and there's all this tourism, but that's also kind of the core of our economy, and there are so many new people that come in, and they check out our churches, and so there are pros and cons to being a tourist-centered location, just as there are pros and cons to living in you know a corner of Montana in a Rocky Mountain region. What you want to do is focused on the pros. Don't pretend the cons don't exist, but don't wallow in the negatives of your specific circumstance and scenario. Look at the pros, maximize those, be aware of the negatives, but don't focus on them and allow them to detract from all the good things that are happening in your specific region. Mm -hmm. My dad, for instance, would love to live in the Rocky Mountains of Montana. (laughs) He got some water, he'd love that as well. That's like his... Fun fact, he also uses social media. My dad? I'm pretty sure I saw him on Instagram. Of course he does. (laughs) Absolutely, you are right. So here's the other thing that I would say. You're also kind of painting broad strokes with like every single demographic, Seth. It's like the younger generation hates social. The older generation hates social. In Kalispell, they all hate social. Also, all the older people hate everything that we do. If that's the case, one important thing to recognize is that no matter what you do, you're not gonna make everyone happy. You know, we just came out of this nucleus launch. And any time that you really plant your flag in the ground and say, this is what you believe in, you're gonna have detractors that come along and say, this is dumb, we disagree, you are bad. Mm -hmm. That is necessary if you're gonna put any emphasis on anything ever. The only way to please everybody is to please nobody which doesn't get you anywhere. Sure, you didn't upset anyone, but you also didn't really help anyone because you Mm -hmm. were too afraid of the detractors. I'm not saying you're afraid, Seth, but I do think it's important to look at your unique situation and say, okay, this is how our demographics are, this is what we're aware of, and we're gonna react to that, and we're gonna decide to serve this group of people. And if the older people don't love that, I mean, that's okay as well, because we're gonna decide to serve this group of people. Final thing that I would say, and this I hope is helpful, and this, is as follows. I'm buying time because I forgot what I was going to say. No, No, I remember. The thing that I was going to say to Seth was as follows, and that is this. Seth, it's hard to navigate change for anyone, and the older people in your church sounds like they kind of already exist. You got to recognize that it's difficult for them to to move forward, and and, and we're living through this huge communication shift. You're going to probably be saying, we need to do this and that. They're like, well, that's not the way we used to do things, and that's very difficult for people. If you can get people to shift their mindset from inward-focused to outward-focused, that's when you're able to truly see change happen in your church. Every church is trying to accomplish one central thing, helping people to love God, love people, and make disciples. The only way you can do that is to be outward focused, reaching to the people that are not yet doing that, and welcoming welcoming them into your church and into the fold of Jesus. And so you need to get into the fabric, into the culture of your church. We are an outward focused church. We are focused on reaching people. And yeah, sometimes we're going to do things that you probably don't like, but you're already a part of the church. You're saved. You know Jesus. You need to sacrifice a little bit of your comfort to reach people. Ideally, every Christian is okay with this. In reality, very few are because we don't do what we say because living like Jesus is impossibly difficult. It's not hard to put your, you know, say black and white and say this and that and say, you know what, I believe in this and these are the bad people and these are the good people. It's not hard to do that. What's hard is when you sacrifice your own comfort, your own familiarity, what you prefer to give someone else a chance. Who cares about other people? I care about me, Roxanne. But if we're able to do that, that's how we can build healthy healthy churches. Seth, that answer was all over the place. There was a lot of stuff in there. Hopefully, you can pull something from that. If nothing less, you learned a little bit more about your own region 
based on the U.S. census data. I think we all learned a little bit about Kalispell, <laughs> Montana. It's true. I knew nothing about it before now. There you go. I also just wanted to add encouragement that like, it's mostly your critics who will speak up. Very rarely. like It's like when people write reviews. If exactly. you get good service at a restaurant, you're not writing a review. You only write a review if you get bad service or you hate something about it. So you're very rarely as bad as your critics think you are or say you are. There are also be the positive side. So my bit of encouragement right there. Roxanne knows this better than I do for sure because she's the one that has to deal with customer support for the most part for Pro Church Tools. When you buy a product from us and it gets delivered on time and you like it, you don't I usually reach out and people. say, hey, you know what? <laughs> I bought this and my product was delivered through email as expected. Great <laughs> job. What happens is someone's email blocks the email we're trying to send them and they're like, I paid for your service? And you you call say, yourselves Christians stealing from me? You're going straight to hell. <laughs> and Roxanne's like, you check your spam. <laughs> oh, I found it. Sorry. <laughs> so it's true. Critics speak loud because we all expect good service. Yeah. No one goes out of their way to give a five star for it. <laughs> all right. Next question comes from Jim. And he says, hey, Brady, I'd like to pick your brain a bit. I was raised Catholic and floated away from my faith. But in the last two years, I've gotten connected with an awesome church, got baptized. I'm in community and loving serving as our online services lead team volunteer. I've been off work for a long time due to back problems. But along with these spiritual changes, I've had some big physical ones and I'm ready to return to work full time working with my church. I've had a real calling to ministry and would love to work in digital tech and church comm full time. I know you're around this stuff constantly, so what is the best way to get a full-time staff position in the field? I've got a BS in computer. Sorry. You just laughing at BS? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> We're having a, this is a struggle today. I, I've got a BS in computer information systems. I've actually made it now, um, now to our LP and other staff I work with that I would love to be considered to join their team, but it's not happening short term. We're a growing church, but things digital for us are not taking a priority. Do you have any suggestions on getting a full-time staff position? I'm not super creative by nature. I'm a puzzle solver and pick up things like a sponge. I'd love your insults. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, you came to the right place, Jim. The Ask Brady Show, where I dish it out. You got it. You heard it about Seth, and I'm coming for you now, Jim. Okay. I'd love your insights. Thanks. I really appreciate it, and sorry for the long message. If you need me to clarify anything for you, please let me know. Well, thanks for the question, Jim. Another DM sent through Instagram. Jim followed up by letting us know that his church is around 2,500 people. So it is on the bigger side mm -hmm. of things. Maybe it has the infrastructure to absorb another full-time salaried position. My feedback on this, as it's a question that I get pretty frequently, is, is always the same. And that is, most churches don't see the immediate value of hiring someone, paying money, to do this. Yep. So normally what happens is the youth pastor is in charge of this or the church planter, the lead pastor is in charge of this or the worship pastor. It's usually a split focus position. And so you have to recognize going in that getting a full-time position in this type of ministry is usually difficult and it's not high on the list of priority mm -hmm. for most churches. I think communication should be much higher on the list. Of course you do, Brady. It's not surprising. <laughs> but most churches don't. So go in recognizing that. So what you need to do is you need to very clearly, undeniably demonstrate your value to the church. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, churches, while our nonprofits, are still needing to operate within the capitalist structure where they bring in as much money, ideally more, than they spend each month, each year. And so you need to demonstrate why you being hired would bring more value to the church than would not bring value. And frankly, if a church isn't willing to hire you, they probably don't yet see you as enough value. It's like, look, that's an expense that we just can't afford to absorb. And so the best way to do this is to do free work. And this is what I've done with Pro Church Tools. Before we ever earned a dime, I had created, you know, 100 pieces of free content basically online. And I had established my expertise in a certain area. I had built up trust with the small, small emphasis on small, group <laughs> of Pro Church Nation, so much so that one, two, three of them was willing to pay for my client services of video announcements. And similarly, you need to demonstrate your value, and this is just my suggestion on the best way to do this, do free work for your church. Mm -hmm. Show how valuable you are. And then kind of 
Give them a proposal and say, look, this is what I've been doing in the 10 hours of free volunteer time that I'm doing, and this is the results that we've seen. I want to expand this to 20 hours or 40 hours. Mm -hmm. When we do that, here are the results that I expect to see. And that's more believable when you already can show the results you've already accomplished. And now you're putting it out to them and saying, look, if you are saying that you won't hire me, it's not because I'm not bringing enough value, it's because you're just deciding that you don't wanna spend money on this, and if that's the case, basically what they're saying to you is we do not value digital ministry to this extent, and there's only so much that you can do with that. But you need to kind of force their hand and show, these are the results that I'm bringing in this amount of free time. I want to bring 4X these results, but I can't do that much free work because obviously we all live in the same economy and I need to provide for myself and my family. But you need to demonstrate undeniably, these are the results I'm bringing to the table in this amount of free work over this amount of time. It's not a fluke. This is what we can do. And I would like to be hired based on these results. You've got to prove that you're worth it though. Mm -hmm. And also don't expect to go straight from like no pay to full-time pay. Like as much as we would love to say that's likely, it's probably not. They'll probably start, if they are going to take a step, they'll start you at like 10 or 15 hours a week. That's why I said 20 hours. Like, you know, maybe you don't go in and say zero to 100 real quick. You go zero to halftime first. Yeah, exactly. All right. Last question comes from Blake and he says, hey Brady, thanks for all you do and the great content you put out for being a small church. It's great to have you as a consultant for our church communications. I pastor a small church in Indiana. By small, I mean 25 people on Sunday, and I'm also responsible for all our digital content, social media, websites, etc. My church also has a very strong caring ministry, which includes a food pantry and other material assistance. We help around 10,000 people each year. With that said, our church website utilizes a denominational template on WordPress, complete with a slider. I found a way to get rid of that slider, and I'm working to try and give the homepage a main focal point like you suggest. But I'm not sure how to do this when our website needs to make a good first impression for new church visitors, those seeking assistance, and donors. Any suggestions would be great. Thanks for the question, Blake. If you go to blog.nucleus.church, we have an article there called The 11-Part Church Website Homepage Formula, and it talks about each of the elements your church homepage needs, including kind of the first four to six that you need at the top of your page. Mm -hmm. And that exact formula breaks down everything, where things should go, the data behind why we chose them. But I want to Go through it quickly here now first. First thing that you want on your homepage at the top is your logo. Simple as that. There was an eye tracking study done by Missouri S&T. It found that the logo was where participants spent the most of their time looking. So interesting. Front and center at the top logo. Second thing you want is the navigation menu. Your website probably has both of these things. Here's where we get into the real stuff. The church website headline. This is where you're making your first big effort of making a good first impression with your new visitors. Mm -hmm. Five times as many people, according to Kiss Metrics, are going to read this main headline as the body copy on your website. So for the majority, this is kind of the first and only shot that you get at communicating with words. We're going to talk about communicating in other ways, ways that are a lot faster than words, but this is really the one shot that you get. And we have a church website headline writing formula. You can also find it blog.nucleus.church. We have an article that has 19 amazing church website headlines. You can look at other churches that are doing this well. Again, blog.nucleus.church to find that. Fourth element, the call to action. You want your visitors to actually do something and you want to be very clear about what you want them to do. So they land on your website. What do you want them to do? We always suggest making this call to action dedicated and targeted towards potential new visitors. Mm -hmm. So it can be something like plan a visit where they can figure out how to plan a visit. It can be an I'm new button, but dedicate that call to action to new people generally. And then also, most importantly, inspirational imagery. And this is the part where you can really make a great first impression. It is truly the best way to customize your church's website. You know, the Nucleus framework is very set as is when you get it. You know, the framework is, okay, here's the logo, here's the nav menu, headline, big call to action button. And sometimes that throws people off a bit at the the beginning. They're like, what if I want to move this button or move this part around on the homepage? I'm like, well, the framework comes as is so that it can look great on every single device. And it's a lot more interactive and mobile friendly. And so we kind of have to lock in the framework a bit more there. But what we let you customize is what truly matters. Your logo, your branding, your fonts, your words, most importantly your imagery. Mm -hmm. This is the most important way of making a first impression and showing off 
what makes your church unique to the world. Because what an image can say in an instant, it would take paragraphs worth of text to explain. And we are able to process imagery so much more quickly than we are words. We've got to read through everything, whereas we can make first impressions instantly by looking at pictures. There's a reason that your newsfeed is full of videos and photos and not text posts on all social media platforms, because that's what performs better. There's a reason that the cliche, don't judge a book by its cover, exists. Because we all do because we're able to see and process imagery so much faster than we are words. In a study of first impressions on travel websites, research found that inspiration-related elements had the greatest impact on how first impressions were made. A picture is worth a thousand words. It's true. We've got the science to back it up. And there are a ton, a ton of studies to prove this. So what kind of imagery do you want to put in there? We have another great case study on blog.nucleus.church that will show you how to go into your church with nothing but a mobile device with portrait mode and take amazing photos yourself. Mm -hmm. If you can hire a photographer, go for it. That would be better. But you can do this for free without any experience using portrait mode on a camera. Boom. I did it. I went into a church on a weekend yep. that I'd never been to before. Roxanne was there. Yep. I took photos of the church in about an hour on a Sunday. Okay, two hours. And then I put together a demo website for this church using Nucleus showing how important visual imagery is and how accessible it is, even if you have no money, don't know what you're doing. Modern photography technology has advanced so much that we can all do this. Even me, I know a lot about video, very little, mostly nothing about photography. That's the most important thing that you can do. I rec- I, I rep- uh, the most important photo that you can use, and we talk about this in the case study as well, is smiling photos of human faces. There are so many A-B studies, so many scientific empirical research papers that demonstrate how much we engage with smiling photos mm-hmm. of other humans. And smiling photos is the key. This is why you don't want to use stock photos because you want to represent your church accurately and not disingenuously, deceptively with other people. They don't attend your church. There's a lot here. It's all documented on the Nucleus blog. Everything is there. The data, the case studies, the research, the recommendations, the strategies. Blog.nucleus.church is where you can find all of it. That'll do it for this 60th episode of the Ask Brady Show. If you want your question answered, send in your question to hello at ProChurchTools.com or hashtag Ask Brady on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Send me a DM on Instagram and I might just say, hey, what if we answered this question on the Ask Brady Show? That's true. Thanks for watching, Pro Church Nation. We love you. Go seize the 167. We'll talk real soon. Oh.